Hi, and welcome back to Creative Live TV. This is our 24 seven stream of what is happening right now, um, given the current circumstances. So we are going into the homes of our favorite creators uh, every week and talking to people like today's guest, uh, Andrew Scrivani, who you guys saw probably for the launch of uh, Creative Live TV on April 1st. Uh, he came on and taught us how to make arancini and then we jumped into how to shoot it so you can post delicious photos while you're at home right now. So without further ado, I am excited to have Andrew here with me today to teach us a new recipe and then teach us how to photo photograph it. Excuse me. Um, so nice to see you, Andrew. Welcome back to the show. Thanks. It's uh, it's great to be back. Uh, I had uh, a ton of arborio rice left over from our arancini experiment. Okay. And I decided that today it would be a really good time to make uh, some risotto. So we're gonna make a risotto with broccoli because I bought a little bit too much broccoli at the market this week and it was taking up <laughs> a lot of room in the fridge. So if you're like wor working on like fridge real estate issues right now, broccoli, I would recommend taking it off the stalk, cutting it up, putting it in a box or putting it in a, in a container because uh, it'll take up less space that way. So that's been my, uh, my experiment. Uh, I have almost everything all prepped out for us today to get started. Our recipe, once it gets hits the stove, should only take about 30 minutes. So we can, uh, I'll take you through the process and then I have some other stuff working in the kitchen I can talk to you about. But also uh, once that is uh, set, we're gonna run over to the table. I'm gonna show you a couple of little tricks about how to plate risotto for photography. And then we'll take some pictures. So uh, I think it'll be, uh, we, we'll have a full hour of fun here and uh you get to see our new two camera shoot here uh we are we are just hacking everything imaginable and it's uh it's it's fantastic so i can see you there i could see you here and then wait till you see what we do with this camera it's going to be like we have four cameras in in my little kitchen here so check it out so uh do you uh kate do you want to ask me anything to start or do you want yeah. me to just jump right in well, I want to talk to you a little bit about risotto because mm -hmm. like we were talking about before uh, we hopped on live, we yep. were talking about how risotto is a dish that I think a lot of people are intimidated by and it feels a lot more complicated a lot of the time, probably because we've all heard Chef Ramsay yelling at people on TV on the Food Network for messing up the risotto. So tell us a little bit about the complexity of this dish, should we be intimidated to make it, or is it actually a lot more simple than people may think? I, I think it is definitely, a, a, it's an involved dish, but it's not a hard dish. And I think it's a very forgiving dish. It's not something that is easily messed up because the reality is that you're consistently adding more moisture to it as you go, as we'll see. And uh, if you find it's a little dry, you add more moisture. If you find it's a little wet, you cook it off a little bit more. So it's definitely not something you should be afraid of. And if you have the right ingredients, like the arborio or the cannaroli rice, that gives it that creaminess that you're always kind of craving with risotto. And then the other thing that I recommend, and you'll see in a second when I flip the camera down, is um, I mise en place my whole dish. I, am, I did reserve one uh, stalk of broccoli just for informational purposes. You can put it, I can put it right here and you can't see my lips. Because um, yeah. I wanna show you what I did in terms of breaking this down into, uh, into the two component parts for this recipe. So this recipe is a risotto with broccoli and you uh, break down the broccoli into stems and flowers. And then once you have the stems, you dice them. And once you have the flowers, you slice them. So you end up with this sort of little thin, like flowery kind of things that cook really nicely. Uh, then I have my stock on the stove simmering. The bigger pot in the background is uh, another dish that I'm working on. It's a, it's a, a chickpea dish. It's uh, just a nice have it in the fridge kind of all week for lunch or a side dish for dinner. It's really nice to have. And then behind me, if you can see here, I have, um, I don't know if you can see it. I'll show you later. It, it's a, a big piece of pulled, a uh, big piece of pork shoulder that I'm going to make into pulled pork this week. 
Ooh. So there's quite a few things happening on my work from home cafe feed on my Instagram story. If you haven't been there yet, um, it's at Andrew Scrivani. It's uh, I've been doing uh, recipes since the beginning of the uh, of the pandemic. I have probably 22, 23 recipes posted so far. They're also on my YouTube page and in the story highlights. So if you want to go back and look at the story uh, highlights, you can catch them there. So there's lots of really good practical information about cooking, particularly for those of us who are not um, seasoned cooks or really experienced or maybe get intimidated by risotto. So um, I think that's probably where we should start. And just before we get us a little bit about um, your your background in food, I know, um, you know, Andrew is a world-renowned food photographer, but he also uh, started out as a chef, if I recall correctly, um, or has worked with chefs a lot. And I know last last um, time you were on the show, you were making one of your grandmother's recipes that was really near and dear to your heart. So tell us a little bit about your background in food and what made you go to food photography in the first place. Yeah, I mean, my food background is not necessarily back of the house. Uh, I was a front of the house guy. I, I definitely worked in restaurants as a waiter and okay. and uh, in that respect. But my back of the house experience basically comes from being a really skilled home cook before I started food styling, which was when I started getting food assignments as a photographer. And I, it was something I did in, in editorial world in early 2000s trying to pay food stylists to come in and work for very small day rates wasn't going to work. So uh, I learned how to do a lot of things myself. And it sort of in the meanwhile, became friendly with a lot of chefs and a lot of people in food. And uh, we ended up with a skill set that uh, kind of rivals that of, you know, food stylists and chefs. So I spend a lot of time developing recipes now. I'm working on cookbooks as a sort of a consultant, as well as the visual artist. So uh, my experiences in food have sort of uh, uh, spanned over several decades at this point. So I've acquired quite a bit of knowledge. Nice. Yeah, that's actually, I grew up in the food industry too and used to actually uh, be one of the managers of a very amazing Italian restaurant in San Francisco called Delfina. Um, it mm -hmm. is one of the best Italian restaurants in San Francisco in my honest opinion. I mean, personally, um, so. I'm a SPQR guy, but. Oh, you know. okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, without further ado, let's jump into making this risotto and I'll be uh, asking some questions as I see them appear on social. So you get, get going and I'll throw out questions as I start seeing them. Okay. So what I want to do first is I'm going to flip this camera down so you can see my tabletop. And I'm going to go gently so that we get down to where uh, you can see where I'm working here. I think that works. Um, so I have, I reserved this last broccoli crown. Uh, it's a little off kilter. Let me square it off. There we go. Okay. So I reserved this last broccoli crown here because I wanted to show you how I kind of disassembled it into these component pieces, which is here are the flowers and here are the stems. So I sort of divided them up. So what I did was first I took this and I just kind of cut off the bottom and I'm going to hold on to that for a second. You can see already these are starting to break apart. So I pulled them apart. You hear that nice, that nice snap. Oh yeah. And a lot of times, you know, sometimes this is a really uh, nice broccoli that the stems aren't really thick and tough. But even when you get the thick and tough ones, you have the opportunity to shave them down a little bit. So that's why I reserve this part, right? Because this part has a little bit of a tough end on it. So I took that off. And then I'm going to just kind of start dicing this up. And most of, once I start to remove all the stems, I'm going to cut them down into pieces about that big. So I still have this piece, which is a little bit tough. So I'm going to just kind of give it a little bit of shaving. But this, these stems re retain a lot of flavor. And one of the things about making these kind of long, slow cook broccoli dishes is broccoli has a lot of like flavor that comes out after it cooks a little longer. So it's a lot, it's a lot more like, um, 
it, it has a, a richness to it. Broccoli, I make slow cooked broccoli dishes all the time. And I really love the fact that broccoli takes on a different character when, um, when you're working with it in sort of a longer cook capacity. So as you can see, I'm just taking down to the, to where we got the flour. If you watch my knife technique, this is something I'm going to talk about a little bit. Um, in some future videos is I usually cook with just one knife. I like this big knife. I hold it sort of, I choke up on it pretty hard and I get a good pinch on the knife. So I have a lot of control. And then where my place, my hands, I use that finger index finger as a guide post. So that's as far as the knife will come. So I don't hurt myself. So I try very hard to adhere to that. And when I'm working with people in the kitchen, Knife safety is something that I'm a big proponent of. I think it's better to work safely than fast. So that's sort of where we're at. Working here. And so you get the gist of that. We're not gonna use this broccoli because I already uh, chopped up the broccoli we're gonna use. So in the meanwhile, I'm gonna turn on the stove so we can get our oil going. I'll take you over there. You can see me in the other camera. So you can see here, I'm going to put a little bit of oil in here, probably like two tablespoons full. Get that going. That'll be hot in a sec. So then the other part of the flour, I see the bottom of the stem still has some something to bite into with the knife. And I will cut them down into those sort of little flowerettes. So I'm going to do that with these. I'll save these for another dish. These are my demos. And Andrew, I intuitively wouldn't have necessarily known to put stems in a risotto like this. Mm -hmm. uh, is that something, do you work with stems regularly when you're cooking or is this just a dish that really complements the stems? No, I, I always use the stems. Uh, I like the way they taste. I think that it's, a, it's, it's good food that doesn't need to be thrown away. Yeah. So uh, I try very hard not to waste. It's something that I'm pretty passionate about. Food waste, is in, especially in our industries, is something that's um, kind of uh, rampant. Yeah, totally. And I think it's important to, uh, especially when you have a pub public platform, to talk about these things is to uh, be really mindful that we can, uh, we can save food. There are parts of foods that we throw away that we really shouldn't. And... Um, that's part of why it's important. Hello, I'm back. <laughs> uh, it's important for me uh, doing what I do and working with as much food as I work with to, um, to promote the idea of uh, using food responsibly. So I like the taste, but it's also something that is no reason to waste. So yeah, and to speak to your earlier comment of you being your own food stylist very often, you can then eat your food afterwards because you're the only one touching it. <laughs> Correct. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so do you think that you would like me? I think once, once I start to work here, you might want to see this from the chest cam, right? Yeah. So I can absolutely. pop this onto the chest cam in just a sec. This oil is getting very hot. So I'm going to just lower it while I put the chest cam on. All right. Okay. Well, I will. How do you do that? I will. I have a buddy that we are this is creative live tv if you haven't tuned in before we are here live with Andrea Giovanni, a professional food photographer and a amazing at-home chef who is doing a work from home cafe uh every day of the week uh you can check him out on instagram at andrew scrivani uh and he's done uh, probably close to 20 recipes so far and every Monday uh, while we're going through these strange times Andrew's going to be joining us at 12 p.m. on Creative Live TV to bring you a new recipe and to show you how to photograph it. So today he is making uh, broccoli risotto and it just so happened that when he was on a couple weeks ago he taught us how to make arancini and he had a bunch of rice left over so now he's putting that extra rice he had left over, uh, arborio rice, uh, to work. And he's gonna make us a little risotto and teach us how to not be intimidated by um, making risotto at home. So 
Right now, he is in the midst of putting on a chest cam. So you guys can actually look down and see what he is making. Um, we, we have a, amazing producers and our uh, and Andrew himself <coughs> has uh, MacGyvered lots of ways for us to make this as interactive as possible watch so uh, he is all set up now and so we'll send it over to him all right so is this garlic i take that is onion onion all yes. right so we start with onion we're going to cook that down just a little bit uh keep the flame at sort of medium height so it's not too yeah that's about where i'm at so it's not too bad And are you looking take to a make minute. those like, like translucent And as you can see here, I have my, uh, my stock is already sort of warming up. So that's going to be incorporated in periodically. And if you're interested in what that is, um, this is some chickpeas that I've had on the stove for about an hour so far. It's a very simple recipe with onions, lemon peel, garlic, uh, salt and pepper. And that's about it. It just cooks for a couple hours and then you have a nice pot of chickpeas to work with. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh. Okay, so the, we're going to cook our onion down just a slightly bit more. I want it to be translucent, but not brown. And this is the other thing you want to make sure of when you do the um, when you do the rice and the garlic is make sure your garlic doesn't get brown because when the garlic gets brown, you uh, get bitter tasted tastes in your food. So you want to smell it. See, like I do everything with, uh, I do a lot with smell. All right, so uh, we uh, first, we sauteed the onion until it was translucent. Then we added the garlic and the rice and we mixed it together so that the uh, oil would coat everything and the rice and the uh, garlic would cook down a little bit. And now we're ready to add the wine. So this is a key component to, um, to all uh, orange uh, risotto. Sorry, you said orangini before it got me. So you can, oh, you hear that? That sounds amazing. So we're gonna cook this until the liquid pretty much is all absorbed. And this is the first step pretty much anytime you're making risotto with liquid is the wine. So you get the wine in there, maybe turn the heat up just a touch and let that cook off. And you can see when you move it around that the liquid sort of evaporates pretty quickly. So. We're getting close, but you can also see how the, the, all of the ingredients that we've kind of put in there so far sort of already starting to get a little creamy looking. And that's the, the, that's the uh, aspect of Arborio that makes it so nice. So you see, it's already sort of, there is no visible liquid anymore, right? It's perfect. So the first thing we're gonna add is these stems because the stems are gonna take a little longer to cook. So we're gonna mix them through and then we're going to start the process that is what making risotto is all about. And that is the slow incorporation of the stock. Now, you can make this dish vegetarian. You can make this dish vegan. It all depends on whether or not you use a vegetable stock. I'm using a chicken stock today. And whether or not you choose to put cheese in later. So that's something that we're going to do right now. I'm going to start to incorporate about one ladle at a time, which is about a half a cup of liquid. So you kind of bring it across, try not to spill it all over your stove, which is what I usually do. And you go one, maybe two ladles at a time and let that incorporate, right? And you do the same thing you did with the all right, Kate, I'm going to incorporate you into this recipe now. You know how? You're now my timer. So you're now going to let me know when 10 minutes have, have elapsed. Because I'm going to cook this down for about 10 minutes. But in the meanwhile, we'll talk about, I'm going to continue to add our stock each time this dries out. So that's how risotto kind of is a kind of a labor-intensive dish. Because you have to stand over the stove for the entirety of the time that you're going to cook it. So you could see now we still have some liquid creeping in. And this is the way to kind of test it, right? Kind of drag a channel 
and then you could see how much liquid is left kind of creeping through. So this is a nice kind of ex having our little chest cam here gives us a good example of technique, right? And you could see, oh, we're almost there. There's almost no liquid. It's so exciting. The suspense is killing me. <laughs> it's like waiting week to week for the new Westworld episode. <laughs> so, who, 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 what, what psychopath doesn't allow you to stream all ten, all eight I or ten know. episodes at a time? HBO just wants us all to go insane. Yeah, no kidding. My God. <laughs> Although last night's episode was really good, so. Yeah. Okay, now that we got our sort of baseline in there, now only one only one at a time. But you could see, uh, like, at the edges, it, if you don't stir it through, it will, it will start to um, dry out and, and stick to the pan. So you got to be mindful when you're cooking this. It's not a leave it alone. This is sort of you feel accomplished after you've done your risotto and tell me can you make risotto if you don't have a oborio rice is there other types of rice that we could use if you're at home and you don't have it you know the rice that you use the bumba rice that you use for um paella is uh -huh. also pretty nice short grain rice that you could use and look i mean rice at the end of the day is rice so if you really wanted to use like a, a basmati or, or, you know, or, or, or any of those other kind of white rices, why not? I mean, I, I've, I've made risottos with all sorts of rices because when I was shooting for the uh, recipes for health column uh, for the New York Times, we did all sorts of different like sort of healthy options. And a risotto yeah. kind of technique was something that we always uh, employed to... Um, to sort of give people a familiarity with other ingredients. So you can do it with a wild rice. You know, the, the rice won't get as creamy. Uh, okay. That's, but it would, it would, it's absolutely possible to cook rice this way with vegetables, with, yeah, with and even it just, fish or meats, you know? And it just absorbs the flavor. It's not going to necessarily be, like you said, this kind of creamy pasta dish that we necessarily think of risotto traditionally, but it's that like wild rice is still going to absorb whatever stock you're using and have a lot more robust of a flavor. Definitely. Absolutely. That is, that is definitely going to be the case. And so if you have whatever rice you have and you want to try out the technique, by all means, you can use water. You do not need to use stock. Okay. Um, you can use, uh, you know, salt your water a little bit just so it has a little flavor to it. But you can absolutely make this with water if you don't have chicken stock or, or a beef stock or any other, you know, seafood stock. I mean, making it, making it like a paella with a seafood stock is always nice. Um, so that looks like it's about ready for some more. And is your stock you make homemade, I, I assume, based on, on it being in the pot there? Uh, I, I do make my own stock. Uh, occasionally, I will use the store-bought, but uh, whenever I make chicken, uh, I, use, I take the bones and make some stock. Last night, my wife made me uh, a delicious rice cake um, soup, and she took the barbecue bones from the barbecue we had in the afternoon and, and basically cooked them down until we had like a nice pork stock oh. and then added some kombu... Um, kombu flavored uh stock you know we made like a japanese kombu stock and keep that in the fridge so we mixed that so we ended up having like a dashi almost and then with rice cake and a little bit of that leftover rib meat and an egg and some broccolini it was delicious if you want to see what it looked like go to my instagram story it's probably up for another few hours before it disappears yeah that sounds amazing yeah it was delicious and uh i don't eat um pasta uh traditional pasta because i i don't tolerate wheat very well uh -huh. so um everyone else was having ramen or udon or so uh, i can eat soba but i can't eat udon and i can't eat ramen so uh my wife made me the rice cake soup. Sounds delicious. It was very good. How are we doing on the timer? We gotta be about halfway through. We're right? about halfway, exactly. Yeah. Five minutes have gone by. Excellent, we're getting there, we're getting there. So I wanna, I wanna tell you a comment that we have from Grady on Facebook. He is 
one of our star students. Uh, hi, Grady. How's it going? Thanks for tuning in. Hi, Grady. Said, What's up? did watch your Arancini uh, lesson, and he was so inspired and had extra rice and made mushroom and onion risotto this week. So yeah, I, see, uh, it's, he was already it's just thinking a natural that. fit. That's great. Yeah. That's terrific. It's such a natural fit. When you have this rice around, you just want to eat it because it's just it's it's so versatile and delicious. I really I really love keeping it around. So, but you can see the process is slowing a little bit. Uh, our, our liquid isn't evaporating as quickly because uh, it's starting to absorb. You know, it's starting the rice is starting to become full. It's starting to reach that capacity. But we're gonna bring um, some more vegetable into this shortly. Now I haven't seasoned this with anything yet. I haven't put any salt or pepper into this. Oh, but okay. I'm gonna wait until um, we get a little bit further along in the process and then incorporate a little bit of salt and pepper. Now, if you really want to go crazy. And when, in stock from last night, or was there a salt that was put in the stock or there's no, no seasoning at all touching this quite yet? This one? Yeah, no, yeah. I have this, this is a not, there's no salt in this yet. I haven't, okay. I haven't done the salt yet, but I will incorporate some salt shortly. And is there a specific type of salt that you like to cook with? There's so many variations. You know, I have so many salts in my cupboard, but I tend to just gravitate towards either Maldon or or um, or just traditional kosher, like diamond okay. crystal kosher salt. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it's good to kind of cook consistently with the same kinds of salts that you know on your data for your day to day, because I think it's um. You get used to sort of that pinch and punch uh, style of cooking, and you don't. If you start using other types of salts that might be a little bit higher salinity, and yeah. you can end up really ruining your food because you kind of get into a rhythm of cooking without a recipe. You know, quite often. Totally. You know, and, and that's why. I like diamond because it's a, it has a little bit less of a salinity than a, a normal kosher salt. And so mm -hmm. you can be a little heavy handed and not be scared that you're totally over salting your food. Yeah. And I do love to over salt the meats before I put them into dishes. And that, that particular salt does very well without, you know, it gets, it penetrates and gets into the meats and it, it really brings out flavor without being too salty. And then you have to finish with the Maldon, obviously. Oh, of course. <laughs> but I have some pink Himalayan that I work with. Pink Himalayan is very salty. Yeah. So you got to be careful with that. Um, I do have some other, like, I have a sriracha salt, which is really nice. I have, like, a mushroom salt that has sort of, like, Ooh. dried porcini in it. So I have some other salts that I work with. But those are really special, you know, like, sort of specialty salts. So what do you think, Kate? Where are we, about seven or eight? Yep, we're about eight minutes, so we have a couple more minutes. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe give it just like a half of ladle here, and then cook that off, and then I'm gonna incorporate those flowers next and cook those for another five. Okay. And then we're done. Then we're actually right. almost there. We're gonna season it and plate it, and then we're gonna walk over to the walk over to the table and take a picture see how that looks so how's this is this mesmerizing you audience? yeah it looks watching delicious me, watching me stir this this is like <laughs> one of those labor intensive watch the guy cook it from start to finish kind of recipe uh videos yeah and when it's it's laborious, but simple, but even regardless of whether it's simple or not, it feels really good to eat something that put a labor of love into it. Uh, yeah, for sure. The more, the more energy and time you put into any given dish, but you can see now the color change, right? You can see yeah. the color change in the, um, in the broccoli, right? It's starting to yeah. lose color a little bit. And this is, that's the stage with broccoli where it really starts to change flavor. So I make a dish, a, 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 a pasta and broccoli dish. And I cook the broccoli to death. I really do. But and it turns almost like almost like a gray. It kind of loses most of its color. Okay. And man, is it delicious though? Because it just takes on a whole different a whole different flavor. All right. So I'm I'm assuming we're pretty close to ten minutes, and this looks yeah. pretty ready. We so I'm gonna I'm gonna dump the 
this in here. Well, it's going to be pretty full. Yeah. Uh, this is a full pound of broccoli. This is, um, but you know, broccoli is going to break down. So this is going to start to release water. And this is about the time where I'm going to start to add some salt because I want to encourage that um, broccoli to release its water. And when you do that, the salt will definitely help that. And then I will add some more later to taste. So I guess that was probably about a teaspoon of salt. Okay. Um, broccoli has a tendency to hold on to salt, like in those little leaves. And it, it, you got to really stir it through. So I'm going to get this all stirred through. And I'm going to need, obviously, going to need a serious amount here to kind of cover this and stir it through. And remind us how much rice you were using in the beginning. I used a cup and a half of rice. Okay. I used a half a cup of minced onion. Uh, I can, I'm going to post um, the proportions for this recipe uh, okay. on my Instagram when I'm done, and I can also send them to you so you can post them. Uh, and you okay. can see that this is kind of gets starting to stick a little bit to the bottom, so you got to scrape, and that's why I use this flat-headed wooden spoon because it really helps kind of dig. Um, I'm also trying to keep my body as steady as possible. <laughs> so you're not <laughs> jostling around. Um, so this is about five minute timer. So if you are my timer again, Kate, then. All right, we were two minutes in. Yeah, we're gonna, I'm gonna keep adding. So I'll, I'll remind everybody, they are watching Creative Live TV. This is our 24 seven stream of what creators are doing to keep themselves motivated and inspired during this strange COVID time. And today we have Andrew Scrivani back he is teaching us how to create uh, broccoli risotto. This is after he came on a couple of weeks ago, teaching us how to make arancini, and he had a little leftover orborio rice. So now we're making, with whatever leftovers you have, you can make this delicious looking dish. It is a broccoli risotto. And after we're done making it, which is just a few more minutes, Andrew is gonna teach us how to take some beautiful photos of it so you can share it and make all of your friends jealous. So, you know, broccoli is not the only re uh, vegetable you can use a risotto. I heard somebody earlier say that they made a mushroom risotto, which would be made yeah. in a very similar fashion. Um, you have to keep in mind that the, the rice itself will probably take close to 30 minutes of this process. So if your vegetables are something that would cook a little quicker, uh, you might want to incorporate them a little later, um, or you might want to uh, do something with them beforehand, like blanch them or, you know, like do a uh, quick saute. And that way they've broken down a little bit more and then you can add them in later. Uh, but it's definitely something that um, you can do with many different kinds of vegetables. So I'm going to turn the flame off on that. And I'm going to give this one, probably got two more applications here to let that get creamy. I'm going to say, actually going to save that last little bit of liquid. Now, who's to say I couldn't borrow a little liquid from those delicious <laughs> chickpeas on the stove. So if you're wondering, that's something I like to do early in the week, especially during the work from home cafe days where I make a big pot of lentils or I make a big pot of uh, chickpeas and try to do something vegetarian. Uh, we are meat eaters here, but I do uh, know that my housemates uh, are not as big of fans of meat as I am. So I have to be mindful that they're going to want to eat other things. What's my timer look like, Kate? Uh, we're about four minutes. Okay. So that's about right. So what I'm going to do is just let that simmer for a second without stirring. I'm going to tamp it down so everything's sort of in there. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to incorporate the last ingredients that we have, which are the cheese. Uh, maybe I'm going to taste it for a little salt and pepper, uh, a little parsley, and that last bit of liquid. Um, I think my pepper is over here, which I just would not hurt to put in and put it in now. And I assume that 
to cheese is Parmesan, but is there other types of cheese that you would recommend throwing in here if you don't have Parmesan? Normally it would be Parmesan, but I am more of a Pecorino fan. Okay. And again, I had Pecorino left over from making arancini. Yeah. So right. I really love Pecorino. And when I do the pasta dish with the broccoli, I also use Pecorino. So Pecorino is a sheep cheese. It is very comparable to Parmesan in terms of its use as a grated cheese. Uh, it's delicious, it's salty, and uh, it's something that I love to cook with. So I am using a Pecorino today. So I think we're getting dried out here. So here goes the cheese. That's a half a cup of cheese. And here goes the remainder of our liquid. And I'm gonna actually turn this flame off. And I'm just going to stir this through, and you could see how creamy and amazing that looks right now. And it looks like that you you did a, a very fine uh, grate on that. Is that mm -hmm. something that is necessary or makes it easier? Um, uh, yeah. I don't know that it's necessary or easier. For, I mean, maybe than like a big box grate. Yeah. But I mean, it's it'll definitely incorporate easier uh, if it's fine grated. But this is so hot that this is gonna melt whatever you put in it. And it's just gonna get, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's gonna melt it all down. But I think uh, we have a, a pretty finished dish here. Yeah, it looks delicious. Looks, uh, looks delicious, I'm gonna, but of course, before we put it out for consumption, you gotta get your That's chef's sweet. spoon and taste it and see where we're at. I have a tendency to over salt food. So this time I went a little light. So I have to think, I think I'm going to probably want some, probably going to want some. Uh... No, nope. I'll, I'll share a little story while you're tasting that before <laughs> we hopped on this morning or this afternoon to show you this recipe. Us, we were talking to our producers and they were saying, well, you know, with a, a cooking show, it doesn't actually have to tastes good. As long as it looks good, that's all that matters. And Andrew piped in like, excuse me, you know, it's going to taste good. I'm making it. He was not going to let us joke around at, at it potentially not being as good as it looks. And so no, no. I this... you this recipe is just as delicious as it looks. And I, I nailed it with the salt because the saltiness uh, that I added, which was about a teaspoon, uh, coupled that with the pecorino, which actually has a salty uh, complexion to it as well. And I feel like we sort of nailed it. And so I have a question for you. Since, you know, pecorino and parmesan are both saltier cheeses, if Correct. someone doesn't have one of the uh, harder kind of aged salty cheese, is there a, like, would a mozzarella work? What would a goat cheese look like? What, what other kind of options if you don't have an Italian kind of aged uh, Parmesan style cheese. Yeah, I think uh, a goat cheese could work here. Um, it's a little sour. Uh, you, you, it, it's not gonna break down the same. Uh, it'll get creamy. Uh, I, I don't know that a mozzarella would work here because uh, it, it may not break down the way you would want it to, but if you wanted to do it in chunks, yeah, that could, exactly. that could be nice. I mean, I think you could take some liberties here with a lot of different um, applications with cheeses. Um, I think traditionally you would use something that is a harder grated cheese, but if you did want to incorporate something else, listen, you want to put a big hunk of, uh, what is it, uh, borsan? Oh, oh that, that, that would be good. That would be delicious. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna finish this with a little bit of par uh, chopped parsley. Uh, I'm gonna save a little for the plating so it's fresh. Um, I'm gonna stir it through. And our broccoli is still pleasingly al dente. So it's yeah. not it's not totally like uh, formless. So it does have a little texture. So if you're worried that this is a little bit too mushy for you, it's really not because it has a little bite to it. Uh, and those of you who don't uh, know the, the term al dente, it's an Italian word, it means uh, to the tooth. So it has a little bite. So. Um, I'm going to flip out of this camera now and uh, go back to talk to camera. So um, I'm going to check, I'm going to check out of this one. All right. Gonna, yeah. Just give me a second. No problem. So I'll remind everybody that they are watching Creative Live TV. 
This is Andrew Scrivani. He is a world-renowned food photographer and one of our amazing instructors at Creative Live. He has some incredible classes on our website. He recently came out with two new classes, uh, food photography for your mobile device and social media for your food photography. So those are two brand new classes that just came out this month. Uh, of his, they're incredible. If you're looking to up your food photography game, I highly recommend uh, tuning in to either of those. Um, I will drop some links to those classes after this episode is done so you guys have easy access to them. Um, today he is here making a broccoli risotto. He uh, joined us a couple of weeks ago and made uh, orange cheese his mother's or grandmother's recipe, excuse me, and had a little bit of leftover arborio rice. So he is now back teaching us how to make risotto with that extra rice. And he'll be coming back every Monday while all this is going on uh, to teach you something new, something new to cook for the week and how to take beautiful photos of it afterwards. So he, we are just about to the plating portion of this episode and Andrew is going to show us how to take a beautiful photo of this delicious dish we have. So I'm back. Uh, uh, I was tending to my chickpeas. Um, question for you. What was that? I said I was, uh, <laughs> I was tending to my chickpeas. Oh, that's quite all right. He also has some chickpeas on the stove. Uh, maybe we'll have to get some tips on our chickpeas for next week. Um, yes. We do have one quick question that's come in. Um, okay. after watching this, what is a good side dish you would pair with this risotto? I no, was I thinking think... of amazing wine that would go with this dish. Yeah, I mean, I would, I cooked it with some wine, obviously, so a white wine is a good pairing for this, so if something light, like a Pinot Grigio, or some kind of a, a lighter, like, Italian wine, which would be nice, or maybe even something with a little sweetness, like a German, like a German white, but yeah. uh, as far as a, I think this is a pretty savory dish. It's very kind of, because you add the cheese into it and when the broccoli cooks down, it's very, very rich and savory. It's a little creamy. Uh, I would recommend like sort of a chicory salad, something mm -hmm. like that has a little bit of bitterness to it and, uh, and a nice like lemony vinaigrette would be a really nice pairing with this um, as a side dish because it would break down a lot of that sort of fatty, cheesy, savory and you'll have that nice play of flavor in your mouth. Now you can achieve that with the wine, you can achieve that with the salad, you can achieve it with both. <laughs> uh, it's just up to uh, what you feel is your is your palate for the day. So um, I am gonna show you a plating technique for this. I think it should work, um, but it, I'll, either way, I'll, I'll explain to you what my theory is when it comes to plating risotto for a photo shoot, because there is a little bit of a trick to it. Um, and I may need to play with that food a little bit uh, and add a little bit more liquid or a little bit more oil just to kind of get it to do what I want it to do. But uh, again, I do all edible uh, hacks to uh, my food styling so that the food remains uh, edible and, and viable so that we can uh, enjoy it afterwards. So, uh, okay. So I got my table a little sort of set up over there. Uh, I'm going to show you what I want to do with this. So let me get the plate I have. Now I don't have like all my regular plates, but this one turns out that it actually works pretty well for risotto because it's flat with a little bit of a lip. So that works out pretty nice. Um, yeah, I mean, I would imagine that risotto easily kind of falls very flat on a, on a plate. So getting the depth and like a nice stack seems like a big, big part of capturing a beautiful picture. Yep, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to get it in the middle of the plate to start. And then I'm gonna do what I normally do with a risotto to get it to plate properly. I already have a little bit of a mess here. Hold on, I'm gonna flip you down so you can see what I'm doing. Great. There. Okay, there's my plate. Okay, I'm a little messy here, so I'm gonna grab a little paper towel and just kind of give a little clean up on the corner. But here's the thing I do with risotto. So you can see as I start of, I sort of let it run down the plate. Now this is really chunky, but you can even see that, you see how it's moving? Yeah. And I let gravity sort of take it to the edges of the plate. Now this, 
isn't as creamy and it is chunky because it has a lot of vegetable in it, but even just this little bit of rotation is giving it a little bit more of a flattening. And I, I kind of do this with risotto all the time because it also keeps the plate clean without having to sort of smush it around. Oh yeah, that's, that's a, I mean, I, I do a little bit of food photography and that's one of the biggest things is like keeping that plate, plate clean because even yep. when you have to wipe it down, you sometimes get like those, those the streaks smears. from wiping it down. So this seems like a great tactic. So I'm, I'm tapping the bottom of the plate as well. And it's kind of creating a little bit of a flattening effect. And you can see that I've gotten it out off that little mound without actually having to touch the food. Yeah. Which is, which is, um, which is sort of the point of it. I got this little outlier here, which is okay. I mean, it kind of feels a little more natural, but I think this is sort of like moving as one now. So I think we've had just about, yeah. So you see that flattening out has really kind of given it a little bit more shape. I'm not yeah. crazy about that. So here's what I normally do when I'm, when I'm styling a plate. I do need to move things around chopsticks. Oh. So I can kind of selectively pull pieces of this away and place them where I want them if I'm not quite sure that I like where it is. So like even that one, I just want to move it a little bit and this. So I'm, I'm kind of doing minimal damage and I still haven't sort of smudged my plate. Now this is a shiny plate. I don't necessarily like shiny plates. But this one, um, I have no choice. I'm here. It's the middle of a pandemic. I mean, what am I going to do? Uh, okay. So I'm going to now give this plate a little color. So I'm going to give it a little bit of pepper. And, and it then, looks like you're kind of purposely letting it fall off of the risotto to kind of have that contrast on the plate. Yes, exactly. That's. Thank you for <laughs> jumping in there. <laughs> I get I get caught up in this. So now you can see like my plate has this sort of nice organic feel to it. And I'm going to bring it over. I'm going to bring this whole contraption with me over and I'm going to reset the second cam and we're going to go over and start playing around with the camera. So All right. So first I'm going to put you over here where we were yes last time. I think that's a pretty good space. You can see the tabletop, or do I have to angle down? I think I have to come down a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Okay, because this I was sort of like here last time. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, I'm gonna get beat cam. I'll be right back. All right, so we are here with Andrew Scrivani. He is a professional food photographer. He taught us how to make broccoli risotto today uh, and he's coming back weekly to teach us every monday at 12 o'clock on creative live tv second recipe to tackle each week as well as giving us photo tips to figure out how to take beautiful photos of it afterwards so you can make all of your friends jealous with your at home cooking he's just setting up uh the scene to capture the photos we are all done making the risottos. So if you missed the actual recipe, you can watch this again a little later today. And I will be sharing the recipe and proportions very soon on social media. So if you want to start making this, you can make this tonight, maybe. Um, and Andrew is just about ready getting uh, his table all set. We are at his upstate New York house in his very own kitchen. That's what Creative Live TV is. We are bringing you what our favorite creators are doing in their homes right now while we all figure out this new normal. And he's just about ready with this beautiful risotto. It has lots of color. There's some deep greens from the broccoli, then a nice pop from the risotto, and then added a little salt and pepper and oregano, or excuse me, parsley um, to finish it. He's uh, placing a nice little glass of wine next to it. Uh, we were talking about some pairing earlier today uh, and a nice glass of Italian white wine or maybe German, a little sweeter German wine from Alda Austria. 
day or somewhere like that. It would be a great pairing. He was also mentioning um, something like a chicory salad with an acid uh, dressing would be a really good complement to this nice, rich pasta. So I will let you take it back over, Andrew, and tell us a little bit about how you're setting up this shot. Yeah, so um, I think you can see me here, right? Hi. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what I've done is uh, I have a nice uh, northern facing window here. It, most of this, uh, um, the side of the house is open to the, to the sky. There are no blinds, so it's nice and open. Um, and there's no obstruction. So I have a nice straight, and it's a cloudy day. So I have beautiful sort of diffused light coming in. Uh, I have this really nice teak table that I shot on last time. It makes a really nice neutral surface that I can shoot yeah. on. Um, you saw me plate the food very deliberately and then, uh, and then decorate my plate very deliberately. And then, uh, now I'm just adding a utensil, a little, uh, a little white wine. It's not a particularly good white wine, so I'm not going to be promoting it today, but, um, it's definitely prop wine. Uh, and, uh, and then I'm going to take a shot. So I've, uh, I switched out from my, uh, my normal 50 millimeter, uh, prime lens to my little 50 compact macro that I really like to shoot with. Um, right. And I'm gonna start here and shoot table level. And then I'm gonna move to the overhead shot and I'll switch back to that other lens. So uh, I'm, gonna just, uh, I'm gonna just go for it here. So I don't have yeah. a whole lot with me here. I don't have reflector cards and I don't have scrims. I didn't bring a whole lot of equipment here with me because when I do go back to shoot professionally, I shoot in my studio uh, back in New York City. So I, um, I also intentionally want to show that, you know, even if you don't have a whole lot, you can make it work. And I think that's part of the whole aesthetic here is that we're making lemonade out of lemons here, right? So let's, uh, let's go for it and see what we get. So I'm going to start here in the vertical. I'm picking up edges. I'm going to show you the back of the camera uh, after each shot so you can kind of see where I'm headed. And you could see that I'm already sort of framing yeah. in that kind of, can you see that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Great. And tell us a little bit about how you're framing it and why. Yes. So um, I like to use, uh, this is a little bit of a bigger plate than I'm used to using uh -huh. uh, because the edges are pretty far away from the food in this situation. And I do like to incorporate the edge of the plate into the shot. So um, I, I think that it's, it's sort of a medium sized plate. It's not oversized. And the fact that it has this turned up lip helps kind of shrink it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. But that's sort of the purpose of the macro lens is sort of get close to the food, but still have this edge and bring it all tight together into the frame. So that's where I took that first shot. I, I, I said I was gonna go table level, but of course I was drawn to the overhead. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna go back to that overhead and kind of just give it a little bit more room. And you can see again, I underexpose my shots very subtly because oh, I like to, I fine. saw that. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I underexpose my shots very subtly because I like to be able to um, push them harder in post. Yeah, so, if so you tell us your the settings you're at right now. Yeah, if you lose your whites in uh, when you're shooting, you're gonna have nothing left for post. So I underexpose slightly, it makes my colors richer, it makes my whites cleaner, and then I like to add black and shadowing later. So that sort of helps me a lot. So uh, now I'm gonna go again vertical. Again, I'm picking up the edge of the table here and it's very soft because I'm at like a 4.0 aperture. And I'm being very careful to catch that edge. Oh, it's really pretty. Uh, I'm being very careful to catch the edge of the plate, but you could see what I'm talking about. If that plate was subtly smaller, I could get closer to it mm -hmm. and still be able to pick up the food, the edge, the plate, the cup, and all of that. So, but the food does look nice. So I'm gonna do, now I'm gonna do a little horizontal of the same shot. Try to stay. Yeah, I'm a little crooked here. Kind of hard. 
sometimes to straighten it out. Anybody else have that problem? I'm sure you do. And again, that's part of this trying to pick up the edge of the plate uh, where you're trying to pick up the edge of the plate and level off your shot um, at the same time. Yeah. So we're getting some nice, we're getting some nice things. I'm gonna get nice and close here, close and low and pick up some of that wine in the background and and tell us a little bit about the difference between shooting on, uh, you know, a regular 55 millimeter, 50 milliliter, millimeter, excuse me, versus a macro. Yeah, the macro um, obviously gives you a focal point that's much closer to your subject. So uh -huh. like the camera, my camera will focus right there. And that's probably six inches. Yeah. So I think that it's um, that's the per the main purpose of a macro is to be able to get closer and then be able to bring the details of something that's on in front of your lens really up into the frame. Uh, so that's the main reason. Uh, even though these two lenses are the same focal length, this lens won't focus this close. This will have to be at least 12 to 18 inches away to get a good focus lock. Mm -hmm. And this this lens will get a focus lock even that close. Oh, that was kind of cool. <laughs> I got it. But here's the thing: when you get that close, you got to give more light into the lens. So you have to change your settings. Change your settings ever so slightly. You, you see, you get this real dreamy look with the oh, backlighting. Yeah. So I'm yeah. backlit here. Obviously, my light is over here behind me, and I'm shooting against the light. I never shoot with the light. Shooting in this direction will flatten out my shot. It won't look very good. Uh, I can shoot cross-lit if I want, uh, so I can turn this way and shoot this way. So I'm here taking a little bit of a wider, taking a little bit of a wider look. And you can see it's also, well, that's a little bright, so I'm gonna make adjustments. Yeah, I mean, you could see that this also will work. It's not nearly as dreamy um, yeah. as our uh, other shot, but it is still pretty. And it, it'll, if you wanted to play with it a little bit more, it's probably more akin to a, an overhead. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. while you're doing that, tell us a little bit, like I noticed you moved the fork. Um, oh, that's beautiful. You move the fork and the glass, you kind of, uh, I assume you're kind of using those props to bring your eye into the food. Tell us a little bit about positioning and like the geometry of the props when you're um, setting up a, a shot like this. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a there's a natural feel to it that when you see what it looks like on the plate, if it looks awkward or it look, doesn't look like that's part of the what I call the food continuum, where it's sort of like between the cooking and the plating and the eating, you know, would this particular scene actually happen in that continuum, right? Would it would it feel natural in that continuum? So like right now, you know, taking a few bites, right? So. <laughs> how how good is this? Gonna turn, how you didn't know this was going to turn into a mukbang video, right? <laughs> okay. See, you don't want to eat on camera because then you can't talk. <laughs> See, and now yeah. there's something like very natural about that look. Yeah, that's right. It's Is that I took like a couple of bites. Feels very authentic. Right, because I just took a couple of bites. I, I kind of positioned it a little differently, but it's sort of a nice organized mess, right? Yeah. But it doesn't feel like gross. I mean, to put it bluntly, yeah, no, right? Because it's watching I think that's the struggle people have. It's like, right. you know, there's a very fine line for something to be uh, purposely messy and then kind of look like someone's it's half eaten. There's a, there's a delicate line there. Right. I mean, the little half eaten mess is sort of something I've made a living doing, right? Is that, yeah. that sort of little messiness to it 
makes it feel a little bit more real, a little more authentic, a little less precious. And that's, you know, that's part of it. That's part of the, the, the charm of food when it's not so precious because 95% of the time you're not eating in a four-star restaurant with this perfectly quaffed plate. You're yeah. just eating food. And if you can make it pretty and you can make it interesting looking and you can take a fun picture of it, especially now, yeah. we don't have a whole lot of other things to do. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's nice. And then if, uh, and I thank you, if you're posting pictures that are better crafted, you're inspiring other people to do the same. So that's pretty cool. Um, I wish I could share this with you, Kate. It's really quite tasty. I, I'm very jealous. I, I actually have arborio rice and broccoli in my pantry. Uh, so I know that I will be making this dish this week. So I will send you some photos it afterwards, just so Terrific. you know that you're an, a great teacher and that I, I'm gonna try to do this with you after uh, after this week. So uh, we can talk about, you can give me some feedback on my, my shots next week when you return. So if we got, do we have time for another shot? Let's do one more shot. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the stove and bring the whole pan over and okay. we're gonna shoot the pan, all right? All right. So if you're just tuning in with us, we are here on Creative Live TV. Uh, we have a few minutes left here with Andrew Scrivani. He is a professional food photographer and is a home chef. Uh, he is just popping over to the stove right now to grab this delicious bowl of broccoli risotto that we made today. One last stop for us and show us a little bit of a different type, style of shot. And uh, he's going to bring that over here in just a few minutes. Uh, if you are just tuning in, Creative Live TV is our live stream that we're going into the homes and kitchens of our favorite creators to see what they're doing, to stay inspired and connected right now. Um, Andrew is uh, in upstate New York at his house, and he is going to be coming to us every Monday at 12 o'clock PST to teach us a new recipe to make throughout the week and teach us to photograph it. So he's back here now with a pot of risotto that he's zhuzhing up a little bit to take our last shot. Yeah, I'm going to switch back to my 50 because I'm not going to get close on this. I'm going to just kind of get a nice overhead. Okay. And this is a is a like a cleaner, like sharper lens that's nicer for getting further away. This little guy is like been my stock and trade for a long time. They don't even make this lens anymore. Sadly. Okay, so we got it in the pot. One of the things I like to make sure I'm doing when I'm shooting things in the pot is getting um some semblance of the handle or the spoon or the edge of the plate or the edge of the bowl. So that you have context because you really don't want to be um, contextually like not really showing what's happening. And it adds some geometry to it as well. It's, it's pretty nice. So um, I'm a little bit under, so I'm gonna go. So you can see this is going to need some work in post-production. It's a little, it's a little gray, uh, but th those colors will come back. Uh, my light source today is pretty dim. I'm shooting at um, about 800 ISO, no, six, 640 right now. So um, try to pick up. That's a little better, actually. This angle is a little better. I'm going to show it to you in a sec. It's actually kind of cool, and it has that dreamy quality to it that you can see that nice light bleed in the back. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, you can see it. Cool. And then, again, I'm using that glimmer off the, the liquid on the spoon. But you see how close I am? I'm barely able to focus the camera here. So I'm going to hang it here off the edge, back up a little bit. And I get this sort of romantic, dreamy shot of my risotto. Oh, yeah. With the backlit window behind it and picking up that sort of shimmer off the spoon. 
to show that nice uh, that that really nice. It's a little it's a little over still. Let me uh let me go back a little bit. Let's see, that's a little better. Huh? Okay, yeah, we're getting some cool stuff here. Oh yeah, that's really nice. I can get it lined up in the middle of the window and lose the window frame. It's nice. See, that is a mistake. Is when a professional photographer makes a mistake. What's the mistake? Can you tell? I don't know. Oh, I, I can see the edge of the tape or the like floor in the background. Is that it? There's two things. Yeah, there's the background with the floor, and then there's the spoon pointing directly at the lens. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I kind of rushed it, and I didn't really look and frame properly, and that's what you get when you don't look at your whole frame. So I just had to uh, did a little portfolio review for somebody, and uh, they asked me if um, I would look at their work. And I thought their work, you know, compositionally was okay, but what happened was they were clipping and framing in very awkward ways. And I think they were ruining good shots because they weren't paying attention to the whole frame. They were just yeah. focusing on what was in the middle of the frame. And uh, the advice that I gave this person was, um, pay attention to your edges. You've already got the middle of your frame locked down. Your food looks good, your plating looks good, your propping looks good, your light looks good. Now you have to work on your frame. And if you're not paying attention to the perimeter of your shot, you can end up with a shot like I just showed you, which maybe it looks good, but the reality is that it's not sitting in the right um, setting. Now it looks yeah. awkward. It's, you can see the sliding glass door, you can see the spoon pointing right at the frame, and none of that seemed to feel all that good. Right, so it's about kind of yeah. finding that balance uh, and and making sure that you can um, you can use the entire frame to your advantage. So what I would do in this situation to correct myself would be to pull this back into a space where I can pick up the edge of the table without picking up that window, just positioning my body and making sure that that spoon no longer is pointing at my camera. And that fixed the problem. Oh, there we go. So now my background great. is consistent. Yep. Uh, and my and the positioning that I'm the positioning that I'm looking for with the spoon is there. And I have uh, I have plenty of I have plenty of uh, you know sort of context in my entire frame, rather than just focusing on oh what's that weird thing in the background and then you distract your viewer and then they lose sight of how good the picture could be. Totally. Yeah. Well, thank you, Andrew. This has been really fun today. I'm really excited to have you coming back next week to teach us something else. Um, like you said earlier in this episode, uh, you will be sharing this recipe and proportions on your social and you'll send it over to me. So we'll share it on our side. So I hope everybody is at home deciding to make this risotto and please, please share your photos with us and Andrew. Um, you're using the hashtag WFH cafe, hashtag yep. work from home cafe, share them there. Um, I will be looking out for them as well. And I'd love to talk about some of those shots um, that you guys submit next week. And then we'll, we'll go into a, a new recipe for you guys to make next week. So thank you again for joining us, Andrew. This is so much fun and I can't wait to make this recipe myself. Excellent. I hope you do. So thanks so much, Kate. Thanks, everyone. I uh, hope you cook and uh, I hope you hang in there. And if you want to visit my uh, Instagram page for some more inspiration or some more recipes, really easy stuff that anybody can do, uh, come and check it out. It's just my name, at Andrew Scrivani. So I hope to see you there, too. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We'll see you next week, Andrew. Take care. Bye. Bye.